With over 19 years of service to the worldwide amateur radio community, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, your all amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is edition number 1000, with a release and air date of Saturday, April 28th, 2018. Please take the program to your air following the cue tone. Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. The FCC releases a notice of proposed rulemaking on small satellites. International amateur radio regulatory developments from around the world are published, and we'll have them for you. Logbook of the World now has a live status monitor. JK Antennas donates a new 40-meter Yagi to AWRL Memorial Station W1AW. The annual Armed Forces Day cross-band communications test is set for Saturday, May 12th. The League raises amateur radio's profile at this year's National Association of Broadcasters convention. And plans are in the works to stream Hamvention 2018 live on the web. We'll tell you how you can participate in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT on what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, talks about the possible end of the Mac and proposes that physical media is dead. Australia's own Arnold Venshop, VK6FLAB, will be here to tell us how to combine learning and two meters. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here with a long-lost archive that hasn't been on the air in over 10 years. Produced and enhanced by the late Bill Barron and 2FNH, W2XOY will present a true amateur radio story entitled Reginald. You don't want to miss it. And we'll have a talk on a new FTA drone operating in the Pacific Ocean that you can work. That's all straight ahead as edition number... 1,000 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio facility in Albany, New York, sitting in the executive producer chair, I'm George Bowen, W2XPS. From just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave studios, I'm Rich Lawrence. KB2MOB. Congratulations to George and the gang at This Week in Amateur Radio on completing TWIAR's 1000th program. Keep up the good work. Reporting from our news bureau in Northwest Arkansas, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. Proud to be part of Edition 1000 of This Week in Amateur Radio. From Studio One in sunny Central Florida, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox, 2 Fox. Reporting from the K9IG News Bureau in cold and windy Franklin, Indiana, I'm Amy Jo Clark. Spring has sprung, the grass is riz. I wonder where the flowers is. Reporting from the Western Catskills, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. 20 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. This is George, W2XBS. Before we begin this week's news, I would like to take a moment here on the top of the program to thank a few people as this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio represents our 1000th edition. That's over 19 years of service to the amateur radio community by our all volunteer staff. During the past 19 years, a lot of people have come and gone from This Week in Amateur Radio, and frankly, I apologize because there have been too many to remember, but there are a few that have been with us since day one. Our webmaster, Greg Williams, K4HSM in Knoxville, Tennessee, who maintains our website and makes sure our RSS feeds and archives of the program are always up, and who puts up with me when I call him and tell him that I need something up on the website yesterday. Our segment producers, Bill Continelli, W2XOY down in North Carolina, who does amateur radio history for us, has been with us since day one. The late Bill Barron, N2FNH, produced many hours of material for the service. Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, our tower climbing guru out in Arizona, started with us years ago. Leo Laporte out in San Francisco, W6TWT, also has been with us since day one. 
Also since our reboot, a brand new segment producer came on board, Anno Benshoff, VK6 FLAV, down in Australia. Our news anchors. I can't begin to remember those who have come and gone from the program, but many are still with us, like Will Rogers, K5WLR down in Arkansas, Chris Perrine, KB2FAF in Syracuse, New York, Wayne Nelms, and 3 LMS from Pennsylvania, who not only anchors, but hosts our website. Thanks, Wayne. Andre Wald, KC0MMY in upstate New York, is another long-tenured anchor, as is Scott Westerman, W9WSW, who has been with us for a long time. I'd like to thank our current staff of news anchors who have been with us since our reboot two years ago. Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB from right here in Albany, New York. Don Hewlett, K2ATJ from Oneana, New York. Amy Jo Clark out in Indiana. Fred Fitty, NF2F down in Florida. And our staff announcers, Brent Taylor, VY2HF up in Canada. And Paul Kalaki, K2FX out in Rochester, New York. You may have noticed that our staff, both behind the scenes and our on-air staff, are scattered all over the U.S. And that's where I come in. I coordinate, write, and produce the program each week, and something you may not know, all of us are current or former broadcasters. So speaking for the entire on-air staff and our staff behind the scenes that keep this thing running every week for the past 19 years, I say thank you. But most importantly, I would like to thank you, our fellow hams, for listening each week, whether it be over the air on your local repeater or via podcast. I would also like to thank all of our affiliated hams who download our service and put it up on their local repeaters every week. This new service is our way of giving back to the amateur radio community. And now, from the Geek Cave Studios down in Albany, New York, here's Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB, this week's lead anchor to get us started with edition number 1000 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Rich, take it away. Leading off this week's news comes word that the FCC released a notice to propose rulemaking, or NPRM, on April 17th, seeking comment on proposals to streamline its rules regarding the deployment of small satellites. This would include small spacecraft put into orbit for amateur radio purposes, as well as small satellites launched by non-amateur radio entities, such as universities, but using amateur radio spectrum. The NPRM primarily addresses satellites launched by the commercial sector, however. These types of satellites, which have relatively short duration missions, have been advancing scientific research and are increasingly being used for commercial endeavors, such as gathering Earth observation data, the FCC pointed out in its NPRM. Until now, the FCC has not defined spacecraft categorized as small satellites. As International Telecommunications Union Radio Communications Sector Report focused on satellites having a mass of less than 10 kilograms, with a typical mission duration as less than three years and deployed in low Earth orbit, which would include most CubeSats. The FCC NPRM aims, in part, to further refine the definition of small satellite. The FCC has authorized small satellites as commercial operations under Part 25 of its rules as experimental operations, including scientific and research missions for purposes of experimentation, product development, and market trials under Part 5 experimental FCC rules and as amateur radio satellites under Part 97. In its wide-ranging NPRM, the FCC points out that the increasingly commercial nature of small satellite missions makes many unsuitable for Part 5 experimental licensing, but that obtaining a Part 25 commercial authorization can be challenging for some small satellite applicants because of the cost and timelines involved. In any case, FCC authorization is required prior to launch, and ITU radio regulations require that no transmitting station may be established or operated by a private person or by any enterprise without a license by or on behalf of the government of the country to which the station in question is subject. This would include spacecraft built in the U.S. but launched in another country. Because the type of operations that qualify as amateur are narrowly defined, an amateur satellite authorization will not be appropriate for many small satellite operations, the FCC NPRM notes. Commission staff may also request a document describing the mission of the satellite in order to facilitate review and verify eligibility of operations in the amateur service, the NPRM continues. The FCC notes that the International Amateur Radio Union will only coordinate a non-amateur satellite if an administration directs in writing that it be operated in an amateur satellite band under an experimental or non-amateur license. 
The NPRM does not propose any specific Part 97 amateur satellite service rule changes, but some more general proposals could affect future authorizations under the amateur service. For example, the FCC is proposing that all applicants seeking to be licensed under the streamlined small satellite process also certify that their satellites will be no smaller than 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters to ensure that the satellite will be trackable as a space object. The size is consistent with the CubeSat specification. This subject recently arose in connection with the January launch of tiny so-called space bees by Swarm Technologies, which the FCC said it had not authorized. Comments on the FCC NPRM will be invited 45 days following publication in the Federal Register. ARRL is planning to file comments. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Thing good now. You know, I just realized I haven't heard from Red Kinold in over 31 years. Yes, he mysteriously disappeared in August of 1976. The last time I heard him was in Buffalo, New York, on CB frequency 27085 megahertz. He was being chased by a gang of disreputable CBers. I hope he escaped. Indeed, that was quite scary. A man, being pursued through the dark, dingy and dangerous warehouse section of Buffalo. And we heard it all, right on CB Channel 11. I do wonder though, did he survive? That is the question. Did he survive? After 31 years, my very own godfather, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will reveal the truth on The Random Access Thought, coming up in just a few minutes, right here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Several countries recently have proposed or instituted changes or announced developments with respect to amateur radio regulation. In China, according to the Chinese Radio Amateurs Club, CRAC, the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology in Beijing has announced that radio amateurs will gain access to a 60-meter band starting on July 1st. The latest edition of PRC Radio Frequency Division regulations, released on April 18th, World Amateur Radio Day, indicates that radio amateurs in China have been allocated the band 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz on a secondary basis and in accordance with the decisions made at World Radio Communication Conference 2015. The Nigerian Communication Commission, NCC, has announced that it's in the process of granting licenses to qualified persons, companies, who are interested in amateur radio services and amateur satellite services for the purposes of non-commercial exchange of messages, intercommunication, self-training, private recreation, wireless experimentation, technical investigations, etc. The NCC proposes that licensees must be 18 or older, be technically competent to operate radio amateur stations in line with ITURM.1544-1, which covers the basic skills required of an amateur operator, and pass written and Morse code tests. Three license classes are proposed, novice, general, and advanced. The NCC proposes a modest non-refundable application plus a frequency fee of approximately $28 for all applicants. India's Department of Telecommunications, or DOT, has released amateur radio license figures for 2017. The DOT annual report shows that 628 new licenses were issued, a record number. The report also notes that 2,594 candidates took the amateur radio exam, the discrepancy suggesting the difficulty in getting the government to issue new licenses, according to Jose Jacob, VU2JOS of the National Institute of Amateur Radio, who pulls statistics from the report. His tally indicates 3,730 new licenses were issued in the past 10 years, and 4,905 were renewed. 
The licensing system in the Republic of India has always been very bureaucratic, Jacob said. The form-filling exercise involves supplying height, eye color, occupation, and details of your father, but not your mother. In addition, applicants have to go through police checks to prove they are a suitable person to hold a license. This has meant delays of up to two years before a license is granted. Here now with more on this story is our own Don Hulick, K2ATJ. Don? Thanks, Will. Norway's Communications Authority, ENCOM, is proposing changes in its amateur radio regulations, such as allowing 1,000 watts output at VHF and UHF for Earth-Moon-Earth Earth or Meteor Scatter operation. The limit for the VHF-UHF bands has been 100 or 300 watts. Also proposed is the addition of a maximum allowed power for transmissions from model aircraft, remote-controlled helicopters, or drones of 10 milliwatts EIRP in the 2300 to 2450 MHz band and 25 milliwatts EIRP in the 5650 to 5670 MHz band. Indonesia has adopted a system of online amateur radio exams and licensing. The government telecommunications regulator has described the move to e-licensing as a form of paradigm shift that shows the government's commitment to provide easy, fast, and transparent services. Indonesia's president, Joko Jokowi Widodo, YD2JKW, holds a general class license, while its vice president, Yusuf Kala, YC8HYK, is an advanced class licensee. Thailand's regulatory authority, the National Broadcasting and Telecommunications Commission, has given temporary expanded operating permission during contests. Described as throughout the 80-meter band and on 6 meters, the privileges cover 14 weekend operating events. Intermediate and advanced licensees will be allowed to operate on the 3.6 to 3.9 MHz band during the 8 international events and on the 50 to 54 MHz during 6 VHF weekend events. The temporary approval extends through 2018. Previously, tie hams had been limited to 3.5 to 3.6 megahertz on 80, while 6 meters was entirely off limits. Logbook of the World has a full-time status monitor. The system status is displayed in real time and is available off-site, offering a single spot for all users, web, Facebook, Twitter, etc., to quickly check what's happening with the online repository of contacts and confirmations. At a glance, the Logbook of the World status monitor shows up if the system is up, paused, or down. Overall uptime statistics and quick stats. A green status means all systems are go. A red status means the system is down. And a black status means that the system has been paused. The monitor indicates overall uptime for the past 24 hours, the past seven days, and the past 30 days, as well as the most recent downtime occurrence. JK Antennas of Connecticut has generously donated a new two-element 40-meter Yagi antenna to Maxim Memorial Station, W1AW at ARRL headquarters. JK Antennas Ken Garg, W3JK, and his assistant Craig transported the new Yagi to W1AW on April 24th for assembly and installation. I am very grateful for Ken's generosity, said W1AW station manager Joe Garcia, NJ1Q. His kindness toward W1AW, technical expertise, and pride in his product is most refreshing. Garcia said the new antenna replaced a Yagi that had not been performing as needed and had failed a couple times in the past. What we did on April 24th was remove the old two-element 40-meter Yagi fixed to the south-southwest and used for all of our 40-meter code practice and bulletin transmissions and replaced it with the JK402T two-element 40-meter Yagi, Garcia explained. Taking down the old antenna was Andrew Toth, who works with Matt Strelo, KC1XX, and Craig. Garcia pitched in to tram the old antenna down a line and off the tower. Strelo and Toth, who handle most of W1AW's antenna maintenance, were at W1AW to perform spring antenna and tower inspections. The installation of the JK402T was a bonus. The timing just worked out, Garcia said, adding that the pair also installed a second 6-meter loop for scheduled transmissions on that band. Strelo, Garcia, and Craig hoisted the new antenna into place, with Toth pulling from the tower and then affixing the new Yagi, making the necessary feed line connections. Garg oversaw the process of assembling the antenna and trimming the elements to W1AW's specification. 
Garcia recounted that the old antenna could not provide full band coverage right out of the box and required the user to pick a band segment for operation. I had to compromise and tune it for the CW digital segment, he said, but when it came to either end of 40 meters, the amplifier was not happy. In contrast, Garcia said the JK402T offers wide bandwidth, keeping the SWR below 2 to 1 across the entire 40 meter band. Garcia estimated that the entire enterprise from removing the old antenna to assembling the new one and putting it in place on the tower took about nine hours. We pause for our stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. The following production of the Ancient Amateur Archives, written back in early 2008, hasn't been on the air since its original airing that year. Written and voiced by Bill Continelli, W2XOI, with oral enhancement by the late Bill Barron, N2FNH, represents some of the best production that we have done over the past 19 years. So now for your amateur radio theater of the mind. Here is Bill Continelli, W2XOI, with the true story of Reginald. Connecting to... The Random Access Thought. In the spring of 1976, I was a recent college graduate and unemployed. I was on the waiting list for several civil service jobs, but the outlook was bleak. My friend John suggested I get a temporary job as a security guard. He was a guard at the local hospital on the midnight shift and said that the work was easy. And so I applied to the security company. I was also put on the midnight shift at a factory on the east side of Buffalo, located in a dank, dark, dingy, and gloomy section of the city, filled with disreputable and dangerous inner city residents. My pay was a whopping $2.40 per hour. Minimum wage in 1976 was $2.30 per hour. The extra 10 cents was our uniform cleaning allowance. The factory was 10 stories tall. It ran three shifts, 24 hours per day, producing, of all things, dog biscuits. The guard shack was at the front of the building, near the gate. There were three guards on duty on the midnight shift, a sergeant and two security officers. We really didn't have much to do, as employees were always on the site. We watched the front gate, checked employee passes, stood guard at the railroad loading dock when the freight cars came in, checked the water tower on the roof, and generally just walked around. The job was a radio hobbyist dream. I had an early version of my radio bag at the time, equipped with a Drake TR-22C, a 12-channel 2-meter FM rig, a Midland 5-watt 6-channel CB walkie-talkie, and a Lafayette pocket-sized VHF monitor, which tuned from 144 through 174 megahertz. The security company also provided us with Motorola HTs, which operated, according to my Lafayette, in the 154 megahertz range. Almost every night, when I went to the roof to check the water tower, I would spend hours talking on my radios. Sometimes I was on CB channel 14, talking to my friends on the west side. Other nights, I was on two meters. And sometimes I would get on the Motorola HT to work my friend John over at the hospital, as well as the other guards working the midnight shift. The roof was almost 150 feet above the ground, and Buffalo is a flat city. This combination allowed up to 20 miles simplex range with the Midland, the Drake, and the Motorola, and up to 75 miles with the TR-22C to repeaters. The Lafayette was able to tune in all the police and fire departments in two counties. When the skip came in on CB, or there was an opening on VHF, the range was even greater. 
I only got in trouble once over my radio operations. The captain, who made 375 an hour, asked me why I was wasting time talking on the Motorola to the other guards. My reply was something like, Captain, I'm not wasting time. I am conducting an interoperability test of emergency simplex communications among the various local security posts of duty. Should there be an emergency with loss of power and or phone service, this simplex network can be utilized to coordinate our security operations. When the tests are done, I will prepare a report that you can present to the main office. Needless to say, the captain was impressed. He gave me permission to carry on, and thus, I was authorized to play radio on the job. Even when I was posted at the railroad dock, I had fun. As a rail fan, I watched the trains go by, the Lafayette tuned to the 160 megahertz rail frequencies. But I was not the only radio hobbyist on my shift. Mark was our sergeant. He was about 27, about five years older than me, and had what we would call issues. He had a problem with authority, taking orders and following directions. The security job was one of his last stops on his downward spiral. As a sergeant, he made two seventy-five an hour, thirty-five cents more than me. Mark was an avid sea beer. This was obvious when looking at his car, a 1969 Chevy wagon, with not one, but two eight-foot whips. One was on the bumper and the other was on the roof. The wagon had two Cobra 138 sideband radios installed. Both were modified to work additional channels in the 10 and a half meter band. He also had a 23 channel realistic walkie talkie. Like me, Mark would go to the roof and operate. Unlike me, Mark did not make any friends on the radio. He was rude, crude, vulgar, profane, and obnoxious on the air. He and I had some arguments over his operating practices, especially when I caught him working skip and swearing on CB Channel 9, the emergency channel. Mark bluntly told me he didn't recognize the authority of the FCC, but he did at least vacate Channel 9. Mark especially had issues with the minority residents who lived in the neighborhood. CB Channel 11 was the home frequency for Buffalo's Black Sea Beers. Mark couldn't resist getting on Channel 11 and making racist comments complete with all types of profanity. Naturally, he got into a lot of on-the-air fights. After a few weeks, however, the locals began to ignore Mark, which infuriated him. Instead of increasing the racist and profane transmissions, however, Mark came up with a diabolically ingenious plan. Reginald was born. At first, Reginald was to be English. Mark, however, couldn't get the accent quite right, so he made Reginald Canadian. Eh? Reginald was a vice president in his father's company in St. Catharines, Ontario, right over the border. Reginald came to Buffalo two or three times a week to oversee operations in the company's warehouse. Unlike Mark, Reginald used no obscenities or profanities on the air. In fact, Reginald's command of the English language was impressive. This totally surprised me, having heard Mark talk. Reginald talked in precise, clipped, pompous, and snooty fashions. At times, he almost sounded even prissy. He condescendingly talked down to the locals on 27.085 megahertz. In an indirect, yet devastating fashion, he attacked their race, their heritage, their intelligence, their paternity, and their laziness. He attacked their mothers, fathers, siblings, children, cars, clothes, and music. And he did it in an imperious, sarcastic fashion. To listen to Reginald was an invitation to hate him. We will continue with the true story of Reginald with Bill Barron and 2FNH and voiced by Bill Continelli, W2XOI, after we pause for stations along the network to identify. You're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, celebrating 1,000 editions on the air.
The local boys in the Channel 11 hood were used to rednecks and racists invading their radio turf. But Reginald was something entirely new. They didn't understand everything he said, but they hated him with a hate far greater than they showed to anyone else on the CB. When Reginald showed up on 11 meters, the locals came out of anywhere and everywhere to attack him. The more they screamed, swore, and made death threats, the cooler and more composed Reginald became. The locals began to drive around the warehouse district looking for Reginald. We could see them going by the dog biscuit factory several times a night. Mark had anticipated this, however. He transmitted from his wagon, the roof of the factory, the basement, and the railroad dock. He used high power and low power. On the walkie-talkie, he used the telescopic whip or a rubber duck. In summary, Mark was able to hide Reginald's location for over one month. Until that hot, humid August night. Mark showed up for work late that night. His eyes were bloodshot, his uniform disheveled, and his breath reeked of booze. Tom, the third member of our security trio, and I knew enough to stay out of his way. Mark, as sergeant, announced that Tom would be in the guard shack and I would be on the railroad dock. As for Mark, he would do the security rounds and check the water tower. He left with his Motorola and the realistic walkie-talkie. I had an uneasy feeling in my gut. Sure enough, as I stood by the loading dock watching the local freight come in, I heard Reginald on Channel 11. This time, however, Reginald was far more vicious and cruel in his attacks. In Mark's semi-inebriated condition, Reginald was losing his identity. Mark's voice and personality were starting to take control of his imaginary friend. The locals also noticed the change. Smelling blood, they went out in droves to look for Reginald. But this time, in addition to the cars, they were also on foot with walkie-talkies. As I stood by the loading dock, I saw a group of five locals walking down the tracks. Quickly, I shut off the Midland, put it in the radio bag, and pulled out the Motorola. I could hear Reginald's voice coming through their CDs. I tried to stay in the shadows, but they caught sight of me, holding the Motorola HT, and approached. I'll never forget that moment. The oppressive heat. The dank, dark air. The feeble streetlights throwing garish shadows on the crumbling walls of the old buildings. A hot wind blowing through the squalid alley, carrying the odor of death and decay, mixing it with the odor of the animal byproduct used in the factory, and presenting the fetid aroma to our unwilling nostrils. And the silence. No one said a word. The radios were quiet. I stood absolutely still, a scared, scrawny 22-year-old in an absurd security guard uniform, complete with a real security guard badge, holding a Motorola HT with a large black bag hanging over my left shoulder. I resisted the urge to look up at the roof. If they followed my gaze and saw Mark, it would be all over. I silently begged Mark to make one more Reginald transmission. Mark, please, please, Mark, please, please do it. Do it, Mark. Do it now, Mark, please. Now, Mark, please. Mark, please save me. Make that transmission. I'm gonna die. And then it happened. Reginald's voice came through the CBs. They saw I wasn't speaking and that my radio was silent. Then, a moment later, Mark's voice came through the Motorola. Base to unit three. Three to base, I answered in a feeble tone. Status at the railroad dock? Everything's fine here, I replied. Their CBs were quiet. They realized I wasn't Reginald. With a look that said, keep your mouth shut, they disappeared into the urban void. I staggered back to the guard shack, poured myself a cup of coffee, and collapsed into a chair. Tom, 
having no knowledge of Reginald and unaware of the night's activities, was shocked at my appearance. Five minutes later, Mark swaggered in. He had seen the whole thing from the roof. We filled Tom in on the whole adventure. Mark laughed at me, calling me a sissy, and said he wasn't afraid of them. In fact, said Mark, I'm going out to the railroad dock now and make some more Reginald transmissions. Tom and I had to hold him back. Mark kept repeating that he wasn't afraid, but he was. Before we left work that morning, I saw Mark take both eight-foot whips off his Chevy and put them in the back of the wagon. He kept them off the Chevy every time he was at the factory. He never operated his radios at work again. Reginald was dead. Three weeks later, I got a civil service job at the Erie County 911 Dispatch Center. Before I left the dog biscuit factory, I did one more thing. I wrote up a report for the captain on simplex and duplex VHF communications. I told him to give it to his superiors as his own idea. In October 1976, the captain called me. He wanted to take me out to lunch. The report on VHF communications impressed the top brass so much, he was promoted to supervisor at a whopping $5 per hour. At lunch, I gave the captain pointers on VHF and CB communication systems. After we ate, I said, how's Mark? Is he still at the dog biscuit factory? The captain paused and then said, no. Mark was fired. It seems that shortly after I left, he showed up very drunk and got into a fight with the second shift sergeant. No one has seen him since. Although I've been back to Buffalo many times over the last three decades, I never went back to the factory. I wonder if it and the railroad track are still there. I hope so, as too much of Buffalo has been torn down or removed. I want to drive by at midnight, the CB tuned 27.085 MHz, and the scanner searching all 154 MHz business band frequencies. I want to see my old 1971 VW bus in the lot, parked next to a 1969 Chevy wagon with two 8-foot antennas. I want to see a thin 22-year-old guy on the roof, having a ball working stations on two meters. But I never, never, ever want to hear Reginald again. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for This Week in Amateur Radio. Disconnecting from... The Random Access Thought. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. I felt, I don't know, what are you, how, how are you feeling these days? I feel, now I'm in an unusual situation because I overshare already. I'm on the air talking to people five days a week, four days a week. So by the time I get home, I feel like anything that anybody wants to know about me is already out there. So I don't use Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and social networks like that, uh, probably in the way a normal person would to let people know what I'm up to and to promote stuff. Uh, it just, uh, I don't, I don't feel the need. It's the same reason I got my ham license, you know, my amateur radio license. I was very excited. I really enjoyed it. Took the test, got the, the general license and got all the equipment and stuff. And then I never use it because I realized, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm already talking to people <laughs> for my work all day, every day. And the last thing I want to do, I know there are people, I know Art Bell, Art Bell, he'll do his, he used to do his radio show, get off the air and then go on uh, and, and, and talk to hams for two more hours. I just want to go home and watch TV. <laughs> I just want to shut up. 
Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Boy, it really is, uh, I think it's the case. It's really an indicator. I've said it for a long time and people always yell at me when I say it, <laughs> that physical media is dead. But we're really, I mean, it's really happening. People yell, oh no, you know, I want my DVDs, I want my CDs, I want my Blu-rays. I want my dead tree books. <laughs> and I, I sympathize. I want all of those as well. I love books. I have a lot of books. Uh, there's something about books. But we got to face the facts, Jack, that uh, while many of us still have record collections, you have vinyl. I bet, I bet there's some who do. CD collections. Uh, it, is, it is absolutely the fact, no one will deny it, that the best quality ultra high def HDR comes on a disc. And for movies I really like, I still buy the disc, but it's a pain to move them around. And frankly, uh, convenience trumps quality in most cases. And nowadays, you can stream anything you want. You can get ebooks for anything you want. I really think that, uh, that the era of physical media is starting to wane. Doesn't mean it'll go away completely. Somebody years ago said, you know, print newspapers, their history, they're gone. And we've seen that happen too, right? They're, it's just very hard to make money with a printed newspaper. But the same person, I wish I could remember who it was, also said, but there will always be a market, whether it's books, vinyl records, daily newspapers, there will always be a, a connoisseur market of people who, who will pay extra to keep the dead tree media or the dead dinosaur media alive. And I think that's probably the case. Nothing disappears entirely. You could still get a horse and buggy, right? You, there is still somebody out there making buggy whips. It's just not a big business anymore. Uh, things didn't get obsolete as fast in the good old days, or did they? I don't think they did, actually. I think digital technology expands and improves at a rate we've never seen before. And there's, there's actually, I think, good reasons for this. There's having to do with the physics of it. It's a book I've mentioned it before called Microcosm. George Gilder wrote it. Many, it's probably 20 years old now. I'm looking at it right now on my bookshelf. And he points out that never before have we, in, in any invention cycle or any technology, have we seen something that gets cheaper, smaller, lower power, and smarter all at the same time. And that's something that's unique to digital technology. That as we design these chips... And we get better at designing them. We're able to make them smaller, which is why everything's getting smaller. And they, even though they're smaller, they cost less. Usually something smaller. Think about a Swiss watch. The smaller the cogs and gears and wheels are, the more difficult they are to manufacture, the more they cost. It's the opposite in digital technology. These chips get smaller, cheaper, faster. That's Moore's famous Moore's Law, that every 18 months chips will double in capacity, effectively doubling in speed every year and a half. And so we're, we're the beneficiaries of all that, but also as a result, we see things uh, coming and going a lot faster and being replaced. And in software, it's even worse. Software is driven by this cycle in chips because as chips get faster, software gets more capable. And, uh, you know, things like better compression mean that streaming can become almost as good. Streaming video or streaming music can become almost as good as physical media. Some people might argue that, but for most people, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's good enough. And it's so much more convenient that it just supplants it. Now, there may be some controversy over my mentioning Macintosh in this, but I have to say that Apple seems to be showing time and time again that, that they really are favoring the portable operating system, iOS, the operating system for the iPhone and the iPad, over their desktop and laptop operating system, Mac OS. It's becoming increasingly obvious. Apple recently brought uh, Matthew Panzerino in from uh, TechCrunch, a reporter from TechCrunch in. He had been brought in last year by Apple during, with a number of other reporters for their famous apology. Apple last year brought in a bunch of uh, reporters, pretty much mostly favorable to Apple reporters, uh, and said, we're sorry, we blew it. Our design of the Mac Pro, when did that come out? Almost five years ago, something like that? Yeah, I think it was, 2013. The design of the Mac Pro was a dead end. Oh, well, yeah, it was pretty, but it turns out we can't improve on it because of the thermal restrictions of that polished aluminum cylinder. 
That's why we haven't seen an upgrade for years on the Macintosh Pro, even though this is the most expensive and the most prized by people who need power, Macintosh. It's the one video editors want, music makers want, the people who use Macintosh, you know, to make stuff, professionals, creative professionals. Oh, and they said, so we're, we're, we, we've thrown out our trash can design. They didn't call it that. I do. Because <laughs> it kind of looks like a little trash can. I had one. Yeah. They, we've thrown out our trash can design, they said. I had thermal problems with it the day I got it, by the way. It was already overheating. Already had problems. Had to send it back for another one. And we're going, we went back to the drawing board. Now, this was last year. This was 2017. But we won't have it this year. They didn't say we'll have it next year. They said we won't have it this year. Well, now they brought in Matthew Panzerina last week of TechCrunch and tell him we won't have it this year. <laughs> but they did say we'll probably have it next year, 2019, six years after the original Mac. Now, you could say, well, the Mac Pro, you could say, well, that's because Apple wants to get it right. Or, well, that's because Apple, you know, Intel doesn't improve their chips fast enough or what you can make a lot of excuses but this is one of the most valuable actually i think it's now the most valuable company in the world with more than almost 200 billion dollars in cash virtually unlimited resources and they say well yeah we you know next year we'll have a mac we made the imac pro for you guys is is that okay and i think what really ha i think what's really going on is uh apple is moving all of its designers all of its intelligence all of its efforts to the portable platform and ultimately we heard another rumor this week that apple is going to start making its own chips for its computers not just the iphone and the ipad but for its macintoshes as well i think this is the writings on the wall apple doesn't want you to think this because they know there'll be a storm of controversy but the macintosh is over it really is and i think that's sad and uh, you know just as much as i think the end of physical media and oppo and x marks and all this is what happens just not enough people need the high powered max more and more people are taking portable devices and your phone is becoming your primary form of computing and it's just inevitable the writing the handwriting's on the wall it does beg the question though what are creative professionals and even more important programmers the people who write the software for ios what are they going to use you're going to use an ipad to write software for an iphone is that how it's going to work that doesn't sound very appealing I think it's just the natural order of events, and I guess it'll work itself out. But what happens, and we see it, and we're seeing it now, and we'll see it again, is that the people on the fringes, the edge case people who need these technologies like XMark, XMarks, or uh, CDs, or Blu-rays, or Macintoshes, we get kind of disenfranchised. It's not a, you know, it's not an end of the world problem, but it is what happens. It will be very interesting to see uh, what the next iPhone looks like, for instance. I think Apple's moving in that direction pretty clearly. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. On June 23rd and 24th, Amateur Radio will celebrate Field Day 2018. This is Ham Radio's open house, featuring demonstrations of the science, skills, and service that is Amateur Radio. Hams from across North America will hold local Field Day events to display the array of equipment and technologies they use for public service and community outreach. For more info, visit ARRL.org slash field dash day. Radio amateurs were among some 600 global visitors signing in at ARRL's booth at the 2018 National Association of Broadcasters Convention in Las Vegas that was held this past April 7th through the 12th. Those stopping by hailed from many countries including Australia, South Korea, Israel, Norway, Canada, England, Ireland, Peru, Brazil, Argentina, Japan, New Zealand, Germany, Belgium, Tanzania, Greenland, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Poland, South Africa, Bulgaria, and Spain. Nevada Section Manager John Bigley and 7UR 
who said many visitors never signed the register, managed the booth with the help of volunteers from various Nevada amateur radio groups. ARRL Second Vice President Bob Viallo, W6RGG, and East Bay Section Manager-elect Jim Siemens, AF6PU, were also on hand to assist. When you have more than 100,000 broadcasting, electronics, and communications professionals under one roof, it's easy to assume that promoting amateur radio is kind of like preaching to the choir, Bigley said. Yet, even in this environment, I was surprised by the large number of people who have never heard of amateur radio. Bigley said the booth's enthusiastic volunteers successfully enlightened and informed many visitors. New to the booth this year was a kiosk with three screens continuously playing informational videos on such topics as the ARRL Teachers Institute, Amateur Radio's response to Hurricane Maria, Young Radio Amateurs handling health and welfare traffic for Puerto Rico, the Land Ops Amateur Radio activity, and information on local ham radio resources and activities. Booth visitors were able to get help with licensing, renewing their ARRL memberships, accessing ARRL services and programs, and locating classes and examination sites. League members also discussed issues important to their personal enjoyment of amateur radio. NAB traditionally sponsors an amateur radio reception at the annual industry gathering. For the second year, the Barry Amateur Radio Society of South Wales in the UK has gained permission to operate within the Royal Mint, and regulator Ofcom has granted the call sign GB4RME, which stands for Royal Mint Experience. The theme of the June 1st through the 2nd event is covert radio, as used in World War II. At the same time, the Royal Mint will release a new ten-penny coin bearing a James Bond 007 theme. They asked for our support in setting up a World War II covert radio display in keeping with James Bond exploits in the movies, said ARRL member Glenn Jones, GW0ANA. Shame we can only play with our toys for two days, but the Mint is a very busy place, pressing coins and awards for around 82 countries 24 hours a day. The building's lead roof RF killer and razor wire Faraday cage, plus electronic alarms, give the radio amateurs loads of technical problems to overcome, Jones said. GB4RME will operate on SSB, CW, digital modes, and satellite. QSL via GW0ANA with SAE. Logs will be uploaded to Logbook of the World. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the propagation forecast for Friday, April 27th. We have a sunspot moving across the face of the sun, and it seems to be stable and shouldn't produce any strong flares, if it produces any flares at all. With the appearance of the spot, the solar flux index has inched up to about 73, so we may see improving conditions on 20, 17, and 15 meters. However, according to the latest report, the spot is rapidly decaying, so enjoy those improvements while you can. There is a stream of solar particles coming our way, but that stream will deliver only a glancing blow with very little disruption to the Earth's magnetic field. Overall, we can probably look forward to decent HF conditions this weekend for events such as the Florida QSO party and the SP Ridi DX contest. On VHF and UHF, California and Nevada appear to be the hotspots for band openings this weekend. And with a weather system moving through New England, look for some activity there as well. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. AMSAT has a new award available for satellite operators. Rather than just be based on being in a certain grid, county, state, etc., this award has several facets for hams to participate. Yes, you do get one point for each grid square activated outside your home grid using a single channel FM satellite. There are two points for sideband or CW and three points for digital. Then add an additional point for activating a state, province, or DX entity outside your home entity. Making this award a bit more fun, if you post your operation using an open or public social media, such as Twitter, Facebook, or the AMSAP BB, 24 hours prior to the operation, you get an additional five points. Take pictures of your operation and post them to social media after the operation earns an additional five points. All you need is 25 total points to earn the AMSAT Rover Award.
There are several more bonus points available, and you can see the rest of them at AMSAT.org under Services and then Awards. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. German Orbital Systems confirmed via Twitter on April 19th that its D-Star 1 Phoenix spacecraft, launched on February 1st, has been lost. The tweet read, we're sorry to announce the D-Star 1 Phoenix mission was lost. We're currently running the detailed examination regarding the causes. Sorry for the long delay with an answer, but we don't want to report unverified information. D-Star 1 Phoenix and 10 other satellites were launched into orbit from Vostoshny Cosmodrome in Russia, developed by GOS in cooperation with the Czech company iSky Technology. D-Star 1 Phoenix carried an amateur radio relay payload, call sign DP-1GOS. It was to replace the D-Star 1 nano satellite that failed to obtain orbit following a November Soyuz launch from Vostochny. The 3U CubeSat was equipped with four identical radio modules with D-Star capability, operating half duplex mode with a power output of 800 milliwatts. Two of the modules were dedicated to amateur radio, configured to work as D-Star repeaters. GOS said a new D-Star mission was planned for late 2018, and to ensure that it will be successful, we'll launch not one, but three D-Star CubeSats. The ASME Foundation will sponsor Ham Radio 2.0, Innovation and Discovery, which Foundation President Wurt Silver, N0AX, describes as a deliberately low-structure affair, affectionately dubbed 2.0 Row. That's intended to be a gathering spot for innovative groups and organizations. The IARU Region 1 Group Youngsters on the Air, or Yoda, will set up in this area, staffed by Florian Zwingel, OE3FTA of Austria, and Kuz Fick, ZR6KF of South Africa. We're hoping to spark an interest in Yoda here in Region 2, suggested Silver. The annual Region 1 Yoda Conference for 2018 will be held in South Africa this coming August. Representatives of the HamSci Ham Radio Science Citizen Investigation Group will be adjacent to the Yasme Foundation's booth. Along with HamSci Forum, researchers and participants in HamSci will be making short presentations in the 2.0 row area. A schedule will be posted on the HamSci website. Results of the recent solar eclipse CUSO party and some of the papers it generated will be on display as well. Other organizations located in the Volta Building 4 near the entrance to the flea market will include FIRST Robotics and Hamventures Youth Tech Area just across the walkway. NSI Radio will be exhibiting software-defined radio equipment by Expert Electronics. The Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers will be co-located with NASA Radio Jove exhibit. Stop in and learn about how a radio amateur and amateur astronomer, Scott Tiley, VA7ITL of British Columbia, discovered that a long-dead satellite had returned to life. The schedule and session times will be posted on the HamSci website. I encourage Hamvention visitors to stop by and leave a QSL card, Silver said. We invite college clubs to hang their colors, makers and builders to demonstrate their latest projects, vendors and individuals to put on short demonstrations, and for everyone to make connections with friends. There will also be some short presentations interleave with presentations by HamSci researchers. We hope to see a lot of new faces at 2.0 Row. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. I'm Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, on the rails, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Long before I took my rail trip with Amateur Radio, I researched it online and was surprised by the number of people, non-hams, who buy and program handheld scanners to listen to the train crews and dispatchers along the way. When our train was delayed due to a freight train on the same tracks with a busted airline, I was the only passenger that knew the actual reason for the delay, even more than many of the people working on board the train. Most hams love to talk with and meet people, which is one of the big attractions on Amtrak. Talking to people in the dining car, I was surprised by the number of people who are riding the train as the vacation, seeing the sights in a more relaxed atmosphere, and a very nice way to sleep at night. Some people purchased 30-day rail passes and were traveling what they called the Big Circle, which had them going from Chicago to Seattle to Los Angeles to New Orleans to Washington, D.C. and back to Chicago. 
They'd get off in the larger cities for a couple of days and do laundry and get readjusted to a bathroom that doesn't rock side to side, then repack and reboard another train and continue their round the nation rail adventure. Many of these big circle people brought a GPS along and used a windshield mount to hold it into the window in their sleepers. Using a GPS on the train to see exactly where you are and how fast you're moving, I learned a valuable lesson. Those GPS units designed for the car that give turn-by-turn -turn directions are not ideal for use on the train, but they do work. So many of these GPS devices also now give warnings when you drive more than 10 miles an hour over the posted speed limit. But on the train, you're never in control of how fast the train moves, and there are no school zones. But the GPS doesn't know that and beeps and flashes warnings regardless. And even though the train tracks show up on the GPS, the little car icon will always appear on the nearby road instead. For all my future rail trips, I'm going to use a handheld GPS instead, something that doesn't warn me when my train is going 60 miles an hour in a school zone. On my trip, I worked out a schedule to talk to a couple hams I know in Central Texas. For my train ticket I printed the day I purchased it, I knew what room I'd be in, and I also found a floor plan of the rail car I'd be in online so I knew who I could talk to based on what side of the train I'd be on. Since the stainless steel body tends to make your radio signal somewhat directional out the nearest window. But one thing I didn't account for is that all train cars except the engines can run in either direction. So until you get on board the train you'll never know for sure what side you'll be on. And at large stations where they add or remove cars, your car may be turned around so you'll have no promise of being on any particular side of the train for the entire trip. To sum up, some important things I learned about taking amateur radio on the rails are 1. Keep your radio concealed. There are usually things near the window you can use to wedge your HT right next to the glass. Always use an earphone or headset and program all the VHF rail channels before you travel. And be sure to download all the dispatch frequencies in cities your train stops so you can stay informed. That way you'll know more than most of the people on your train. 2. Handheld GPS like the Model 20X works better than turn-by-turn -turn GPS for the car. 3. The passenger cars have electrical outlets all over the place for charging your HT or computer, but I'd bring spare batteries anyway. 4. Some good reasons not to take the train would be that you're in a big hurry, or you must arrive exactly on time, or you're a heavy cigarette smoker, or you're addicted to Facebook and Twitter. 5. If your HT also works as a broadcast receiver, it may work better than you think, maybe because the rail cars are so tall, you're usually on the second story, and we all know that higher is better for hams. And last, I had pretty decent coverage with a small 3G hotspot for cellular data along the way, but I still brought my repeater director and talked to hams in five states and had a great time on the rail. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP in sunny Phoenix, Arizona, on the rails, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Foundations of Amateur Radio Last week during F Troop, something very interesting happened. If you're not familiar with F Troop, it's a weekly net for new and returning amateurs. And every Saturday we welcome callers to the one hour net to discuss anything and everything Amateur Radio. It's been going for about seven or so years, about as long as I've been making this weekly contribution to the hobby. Normally there's a host, often it's me, but not always handing the microphone to the next person who then in turn hands the microphone back and the host passes it on to the next caller. This is helpful for new amateurs who then only need to remember two call signs, their own and that of the host. It's a safe place where people can ask questions and hopefully find an answer, make a mistake, say the wrong call sign, have their roger beep turned on, be off frequency, all the typical things you do when you're learning or when you've dusted off an old radio after having been away from the hobby for a while. Last week we had a surprise visitor, a special event station, Victor India 4 Golf Alpha Mike Echo Sierra, operated by Reg VK2 M&M, who in the midst of the Commonwealth Games was having little success on HF and decided to join in on our net. After saying hello and calling in other stations, I started handing the microphone to each caller, encouraging them to make a contact with VI4 Games, so they could each claim a contact, end up in the log, and get a QSO card for their trouble. Sitting on the side was hard, but at the same time it was extremely rewarding. I witnessed stations calling a special event station for the first time in their life, dealing with strange call signs, interruptions, distortions and delays, misheard phonetics, incorrect procedures, you name it. I heard it all. 
There were some who just made the contact and moved on, handing the microphone back to the host and others who started a whole discussion about their life, their station, and their joy in making the contact. There were stations just saying their call sign without phonetics, or saying it once, or fast, stomping on the other station, all the things that happen in real life when you're trying to make a contact using HF and SSB. Just to reiterate, this was on 2 meter FM, connected via IRLP, Echolink and Allstar to repeaters across the globe, with callers in Australia, New Zealand and the United States. It was eye-opening for me. In the past, I've attempted to make contest examples, to make DX contact simulations, and try to get people to change frequency and check back in. As serendipity would have it, this was by far the most learning I've ever seen in the seven years of this net, and I'd encourage anyone to try this at home. Some of the direct takeaway tips from this are that using phonetics on 2 meter FM is not stupid and sometimes it's even required. Repeating your call sign to a new station is not a waste of airtime, since you have no insight whatsoever as to the state of their receiver. You don't know if they have a poor antenna, or if they're connected via the internet if the link is not optimal or the volume not set correctly. Waiting until the carrier drops on the repeater is a must for many repeaters, and keying and talking at the same time is a recipe for being misunderstood. Key your microphone, wait a heartbeat, and then start talking. Leaving gaps between overs allows other players onto the field, and you should see that as an opportunity, not a burden. I'm sure there were other things that were learned on that random Saturday, and who knew that you could learn that much from 2 meter FM, special event stations, and some patience. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The new Santa Barbara section manager, John Kitchens, NS6X of Somas, California, is getting a head start stepping into the job a couple months earlier than the scheduled date. No nominations for the post were received by the nomination deadline last September, and nominations were resolicited for the 18-month term starting on July 1st. Kitchens, the only nominee, was declared elected, succeeding Jim Fortney, K61YK, who served as Santa Barbara SM since January 2016. Fortney did not run for a new term because he has moved from the section, although he graciously extended his service by a few months until Kitchens had been formally declared elected and was ready to assume duty. Kitchens has been a radio amateur since 1966. He especially enjoys low power, VHF and UHF operating, building equipment and antennas, and contesting. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. I'm Kent Peterson, KC0, DGY. In mid-March, I was working on a story on the Jupiter Amateur Radio Club and their automatically piloted drone operating in the Pacific Ocean with an autonomously operated FT-8 ham radio station aboard. My conversation with Kurt Kiso, N6FW, contained so much useful info that we decided to share a much longer version of that conversation with the Rain Report audience. Here's Kurt Kiso. We are a scientific research foundation founded back in the early 2000s, initially around listening to humpback whales in the waters off of Hawaii. That developed into building electronic systems that would allow us to listen to the humpback whales on shore, as well as stream them onto the internet. From there, we were using buoys to collect that data. So we would have hydrophones attached to buoys. We'd have a UHF repeater system up on the mountain in Hawaii that would hear those buoys and then repeat the signal so that we could capture it on shore and then ultimately stream it onto the internet. As we were doing that project, we struggled with keeping the buoys moored. The challenging part of the system was always the anchor system or the noise of the anchor system that the hydrophone would pick up. Necessity is the mother of invention, they say. We decided that we needed a way to keep the hydrophone in place without an anchor system. And so we invented a technology called the wave glider. 
which is an autonomous maritime vehicle that harvests wave energy for propulsion. So we developed that, ultimately developed a company to take that product to market, spun that company out of the Research Foundation. That company was named Liquid Robotics. Over the course of the subsequent decade, Liquid Robotics developed and perfected the invention and has sold hundreds of units to the government, oil and gas, and scientific research. Meanwhile, Jupiter Research Foundation continued to be a customer of Liquid Robotics, and we acquired a few wave gliders ourselves. Subsequently, we put those wave gliders to work in different capacities. One, of course, is continuing to have a hydrophone on station so that we can listen to the humpback whales and put them on the web when they're in Hawaii in the winter. We've also developed some other technologies, telemetry technologies, some different sensors, one that's very interesting is a microscope that's actually a real-time imaging microscope that stays out on the ocean for months at a time, collecting images of plankton and other microscopic subjects. Meanwhile, while all of this was happening, those of us that are hams inside of Jupiter Research Foundation mm -hmm. thought it would be interesting to put a beacon ham station on a wave glider. This is probably about, I don't know, six years ago, seven years ago. So we built a little uh, QRP CW beacon on 20 meters and put it out in the water. And sure enough, you could hear it all over the place. Eventually, we decided we'd like something more interactive. And that led to the current project that we're engaged in today, which is called HF Voyager. The wave glider itself consists of three components, what we call the surface expression or float. And in your mind's eye, imagine a, a paddleboard or a large surfboard. And on that are solar panels for collecting solar energy to uh, generate electricity, as well as GPS receiver, any other radio equipment you might have, or surface-based sensors. Electronics, batteries, all of those sorts of things are housed on the float. Then there is an umbilical, which is a component that connects the float down to the propulsor, or we call it the sub, and the sub is where the actual wave energy is converted into thrust. In your mind's eye, envision a spine with wings on either side that looks kind of like a Venetian blind if you're looking straight down at the sub. Those wings are hinged on their leading edge. The motion that we're harvesting is as every wave peak goes by, the float is lifted relative to, let's say, the seafloor. And then as the trough comes by, gravity pulls the float back down closer to the seafloor. Well, as that occurs, there is a relative difference in the motion of the water at the surface where the float is and at eight meters depth where the sub is. That relative difference in motion causes the wings to, they're hinged on their leading edge. And so as the float pulls the system up through the water column, the wings tilt leading edge up, trailing edge down. And then as the wave trough comes by and the float goes lower and the sub sinks, if you will, through the water column, those wings tilt so the trailing edge is up relative to the leading edge being down. And so if you envision this occurring kind of in a sinusoidal form, you see that the wings flap. Well, that flapping motion is essentially a vector transformer converting the vertical motion into horizontal thrust. And so what we've created is as long as there is wave energy, we have perpetual motion. I mean, it's not a perpetual motion machine, but it will go and continue to flap as long as there's wave energy. So that drives us forward. At the tail of the sub, we have a rudder and that rudder allows us to steer left or right. On the surface, there's a GPS, so we know where we are, and we can calculate the heading to where we want to go. We send that heading information down to the sub, and using its compass and its rudder, it points itself in the right direction, and that allows us to essentially continue to move in, you know, uh, towards our target. If we want to hold station somewhere, we basically just make a circle around a target or fly a figure eight through a target. If in the case of the HF Voyager mission, we wanna sail across an ocean, we set up a series of waypoints and the wave glider flies from one wave point to the next at a speed of approximately two knots. So if you can imagine this is always moving at about two knots across the surface of the ocean, 
you know, it takes us, you know, roughly a day to go, say, 40, 50 miles, depending on conditions. The more wave energy there is, the faster we go, up to about two and a half knots. And of course, if the wave energy dies down, if we find ourselves in doldrums, we can be going extremely slow. You know, in the worst case scenario, we just would drift. So the true speed across ground ultimately is a combination of available wave energy versus the current and whatever that allows us to do. But I typically say that our mission plan should consider us going somewhere between 25 and 40 miles a day. That's how the wave glider system works. One other component of the wave glider that I really need to mention is its command and control system is via the Iridium satellite network. And again, this is a commercial product. So whether you're uh, science or commercial or defense, you need a way to control the system and Iridium supports all of those markets. It's a reliable, ubiquitous communication system. When you purchase or acquire a wave glider, it has an Iridium satellite system embedded in it. And uh, the control of the wave glider is managed through a website and the website then is connected to the Iridium system and, and so command and telemetry can go back and forth between the operator and the platform. And, th and this all works fine. Then you, you need to put a wave glider to use beyond just driving it around on the surface of the ocean, you want it to do a task. Well, again, in the case of Jupiter Research Foundation, our first task was to host our hydrophone so that we could listen to humpback whales on shore in Hawaii. That was typically a near shore mission within line of sight of the shore. We initially started out with UHF radios, but then uh, ultimately in the past few years as cellular systems have improved and cellular modem technology and data rates have become more affordable, we've changed to a digital stream and we now use a Verizon modem, a 4G modem on board to stream digital audio uh, from the hydrophone to shore. And then that's what, what ends up on our website. So that was the primary mission for Jupiter. You're listening to a conversation I had with Kurt Kiso, N6FW of the Jupiter Amateur Radio Club and their autonomous digital ham radio station operating from a drone in the Pacific Ocean. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. As time went on, we decided to deploy HF on board. Our original project was a CW beacon. That was interesting, but we decided we wanted something interactive. We initially explored the concept of having an interactive CW station, but then we quickly moved to looking at PSK31 as a digital mode communication with the wave glider. And again, this would be an onboard station that would allow an amateur radio operator from anywhere in the world to contact our station on the wave glider and have a brief QSO. And this project was going along very well. In fact, our intent was to actually add a chatbot type architecture on the back end of that station on the water so that an operator on shore, although you'd know you were talking to an automated system, the interactive QSO would be something like you were actually interacting with a human. Well, as we were about to launch that for a significant mission for a few months, FT8 came to light. And so this was uh, back last year in June, July timeframe. When we had a chance to look at the opportunity to deploy FT8 on board our system, we decided that that was probably an even more efficient and more enjoyable way to interact with this maritime mobile autonomous station. So we delayed our launch. We took some time to write some custom software that would allow us to have our station both call CQ and respond to calls in the FT8 mode. This is all on 20 meters, I should add. We currently are a mono band system, although there are plans in the future to add multi band. But the way we operate today is we're on almost 24 by 7. If there's a significant overcast or you know, dense cloud cover, we may need to shut down for a day or two to preserve our solar energy, our battery power, which of course is regenerated through solar energy. But generally the system is on and you can either call our call sign 
Kilo Hotel 6 JF, as in Jupiter Foundation, stroke MM, or listen for our CQ and have a QSO with us uh, via FT8, just right above 14074 in the typical watering hole for FT8 on 20 meters. To operate within both the letter and the spirit of the rules, we did a couple of things that I think are rather important. There is a control operator anytime the system's on. That control operator is connected to the platform via the Iridium control channel so that if there were any issues with our transmission, or performance of the station, they have the ability out of band to either address the issue or turn the station off. So we have full-time control operators when the station is on. And the second thing is we wrote some algorithms that actually make sure that we don't step on other stations. So when the operator on shore asks the HF Voyager in the water to call CQ, the first thing the Voyager does is looks at the last minute of history on what signals were where within the waterfall and finds an opening before it will transmit. We felt that it was the appropriate thing to do so that we could be a courteous operator. Those things were successful. We then had to address the logging. So basically every time we make a contact, we use Iridium to send the log information back to shore where we process it. And currently it appears in near real time on the user portal site for our project, you simply search for HF Space Voyager on Google. You'll go right to our page, but there is a user portal page that shows a, a world map where the glider is today and all the contacts that it's made. And you can filter those contacts by call sign or by date, time, and so forth, and you can see your name in the list. That all happens in near real time. The second thing is I manually today extract the data from the database and post to QRZ in a log there. Again, under our call sign, if you search for Kilo Hotel 6 JF stroke MM, you'll find the log there. And as of this morning, I have 1,236 QSOs in the log, and that's all pretty much transpired since the first of the year when we launched this mission. We have 20 countries in the log, and I think it's about 870 unique operators that make up that 1,200 contacts. So it's been pretty exciting. I think one thing that's worth mentioning here, this interview is only the second piece of public relations or promotion, if you will, that we've done with the project. The only other thing was we were included in a press release for the primary mission on this particular wave glider, which I'll discuss in a moment. The point here is all of those contacts and all of the interest in this project has basically been viral or organic. We haven't done anything to push this mission because this was really our first mission and we wanted to see how it worked before we put it out there that it was going to be up all the time and that it was going to be problem free. We really wanted to test it. Well, the test has gone very well. It's been in the water since January 15th on this mission and uh, it's been working great. Let me describe the station itself. On board, in one of the waterproof payload containers, we have an Elecraft KX3 connected to a Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi is where the uh, WSJTX software, uh, our modified version of that software, is running. It's also where all the logging occurs and the processing of the contacts and log files and packaging up those up to send them to shore via the WaveGliders Iridium system. So inside that payload box, you've got the, the KX3, the, the Raspberry Pi, and some power control systems. The KX3 is equipped with an automatic antenna tuner, which in this case is critical because as you can imagine, as this moves around on the water, the antenna tuning changes. We typically will ask the, the uh, Elecraft to check the antenna tuning once a day, just in case something's gotten out of whack and, and we don't want to damage their radio. So speaking of the antenna, we have a what is typically a bumper mounted Hustler mast with a top loading coil, again on 20 meters. The antenna is approximately six and a half feet tall above the deck of the wave glider itself. And we went to a lot of uh, effort to harden it for the marine environment. We have a significant spring, the kind that you would think of on a, a military vehicle to support the antenna just above the water line. And then the antenna above that, all the joints of course have been sealed and heat shrink tubing on everything. We also have a bronze plate 
in the base of the surfboard, if you will, uh, below the waterline that actually acts as a coupler for our ground plane. So the antenna is basically a top-loaded quarter wave uh, antenna counterpoised against the surface of the ocean. Uh, we typically run either three or five watts, which is plenty of power. And as I mentioned earlier, we've had contacts in over 20 countries. The one European country is Norway. And of course, we pretty much have contacts all throughout the Pacific Rim and Oceania as well. And that's all, again, done with uh, just five watts. I think we have about 12 members in the club. It's not very large. Jupiter Research Foundation is filled with people that are scientific-minded, uh, engineering-minded, uh, creative-minded. We're kind of makers, if you will. About a, uh, maybe a third to a half of the Jupiter Research Foundation employees, it's a small organization, about 15 people. About, I would say maybe six or seven of us are amateur radio operators. So. As we discussed it, we decided that we should form an amateur radio club. The foundation offered to underwrite projects that we wanted to do that would include amateur radio. As a result, our club has this fantastic benefactor, uh, which happens to be uh, some of the members' employer. So uh, it, it, it worked out well that way, but it's also allowed us to have a station here at the office in Los Altos, California, and another station at our facility in Hawaii where we do our wave glider operations. So it's a unique amateur club in that regard that it's sponsored by our organization. Uh, but I think very similar to back in the day when many large corporations had amateur radio clubs and you'd frequently see a trailer or antennas out in the parking lot of their headquarters buildings. We're very similar to that as electronics aficionados, science aficionados, physicists. It's a natural fit for amateur radio to be a part of the things that we're interested in. It's a blessing that our organization sponsors this. And that concludes my conversation with Kurt Kiso, N6FW, of the Jupiter Amateur Radio Club, who are operating HF Voyager, a self-contained, interactive, FT8 digital ham radio station aboard an aquatic drone in the Pacific Ocean. I'm Kent Peterson, KC0, DGY, bidding you a very 73. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. Members of the Dominica Amateur Radio Club Incorporated, or DARCY, held a second field day style emergency preparedness awareness and recruiting exercise on April 21st. Radio amateurs on the Caribbean island are continuing the process of taking on a larger role in emergency preparedness and response for the Atlantic hurricane season, which begins June 1st. Dominica suffered severe damage from Hurricane Maria last September and, using their remaining resources in the storm's aftermath, radio amateurs there played a leading role in establishing communication links and providing necessary information to the public. Brian McChesney, K1LI, is among those assisting Dominica's amateur radio community in forming a stronger position for response to future emergencies that may affect the small island nation. The Yasmi Foundation, Yezu, the Foundation for Amateur International Radio Service, the CDAC Network, and GoFundMe contributors have donated equipment, provided material support, or delivered training. The purpose of the field day was to exercise our state of preparedness, expose the novice class and students to a field day, get hands-on experience in setting up equipment, and make contact with the other field day stations, said Roger Blanchard, J73MBQ of Darcy, in a post on the Caribbean Emergency and Weather Net website. Darcy blanketed the country, hosting some 150 visitors of all ages at stations set up at the J73Z Club site in Canefield, the Botanical Gardens, and Police Headquarters in the capital of Rousseau, and at high-visibility sites in Grand Bay, Goodwill, Castle Bruce, Portsmouth, Salisbury, and Capuchin. 
The six-hour exercise involved an exchange of communications among all participating stations on 75 and 40 meters, as well as on VHF and UHF. We also had good communications with Trinidad, Barbados, Martinique, St. Lucia, and Anguilla, Blanchard said. The students were exposed to all the various modes of communication we can use as hams and made contact with other amateur radio operators. Darcy said the purpose of the field day style exercise was achieved with good attendance and lots of fun. Overall, 16 radio amateurs on Dominica took part in the exercise chaired by John Mitchell, J73MH. Following last year's storms, the Dominican government has been working to establish a stronger partnership with Darcy with the goal of ensuring that future disaster communication is not entirely dependent on commercial telecommunication providers. Machesney and his wife Michelle are planning to get additional complete amateur radio stations where they are needed on Dominica. With the next storm season just over the horizon, the government of Dominica seems to be responding to recommendations made by non-governmental organizations that worked on the ground after Hurricane Maria, McChesney said earlier this month. Despite continuing challenges with commercial power and telecommunication services on Dominica, we have been able to establish somewhat regular channels with people we know in country and have helped kindle training and equipping programs in several outlying areas. Amateur radio on Dominica is not new. Darcy celebrated its 55th anniversary last fall and radio amateurs have always pitched in to provide emergency communication. The Dominican government wants to tighten up its relationship with Darcy to establish a plan that would include trained radio amateurs being strategically located within governmental organizations, hospitals, and elsewhere. Darcy has embarked on an ambitious recruiting drive to be sure there are hams in every corner of the country, McChesney told ARRL. He's also hoping to get hams on Dominica and elsewhere in the Caribbean Basin more involved in ARRL Field Day, June 23rd and 24th. Produced by amateurs for amateurs and originating from Albany, New York, you're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. The Military Auxiliary Radio System, or MARS, will sponsor the traditional military amateur radio communication tests to mark the 67th annual Armed Forces Day on Saturday, May 12th. Armed Forces Day is May 19th, but the AFD Crossband Military Amateur Radio event traditionally takes place one week earlier in order to avoid conflicting with Hamvention. Complete information, including military stations, modes, and frequencies, is available on the U.S. Army Mars website. The annual celebration is a unique opportunity to test two-way communication between radio amateurs and military stations authorized under Part 97.111 of the Amateur Service Rules. It features traditional military-to-amateur crossband SSB voice, CW, practice using legacy interoperability waveforms and the opportunity for participating hams to utilize more modern military modes such as MIL-STD serial PSK and automatic link establishment. Military stations and amateur radio stations are authorized to communicate directly on certain 60-meter interoperability channels. These tests give amateur radio operators and shortwave listeners a chance and a challenge to demonstrate individual technical skills in a tightly controlled exercise scenario and to receive recognition for the appropriate military radio station. QSL cards will be available for stations successfully contacting participating military stations. Military stations will transmit USB unless otherwise noted on the schedule on selected military frequencies and will announce the specific amateur frequencies they are monitoring. Mars stressed that frequencies used for the test will not impact any public or private communications and will not stray outside the confines of the exercise. An Armed Forces Day test message will be transmitted utilizing the military standard serial PSK waveform M110 followed by MIL STD Wide Shift FSK 850 Hz RTTY as described in MIL STD 188-110AB. 
Technical information regarding these waveforms is available. The AFD test message will also be sent at 0300 UTC in CW. Those who want a QSL should complete the request form on the Mars website. And finally this week, amateur radio roundtable host Tom Medlin, W5KUB, will once again live stream selected activities from the 2018 Hamvention in Xenia, Ohio during what he calls the Hamvention Marathon webcast with more than 40 hours of live video from the annual show. This will mark Medlin's 17th year covering the show for those unable to attend Hamvention. Our motto is bringing ham radio to you, Medlin said. We want to give everyone the experience of feeling like they are part of this ham radio event. Medlin said viewers can not only see what's going on at Hamvention, but they can also use the chat room to communicate directly with the W5KUB group. Astronaut Doug Wheelock, KF5BOC, is scheduled to be with us again for the fifth year as co-host, Medlin noted. We give away thousands of dollars in prizes to our viewers. If we call your name and you answer, you are a winner. Prizes like antenna analyzers, mobile rigs, HTs, antennas, etc. are just a few to name. The excitement is not just at the booth in Xenia. We stream our 10-hour drive live there and back to Memphis, Tennessee. Watch the drive, the scenery, communicate with the group, watch us get in traffic, get lost, or even get stopped by police for speeding. Yes, that has happened before, and everyone in the chat room was taking up a collection to bail us out of jail, Medlin noted. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial